Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to this last talk prior to the closing keynote. Hope everyone's revved up appropriately. Hope my laptop stops falling asleep. Um, so the topic of my talk today is small talk and learning from it. So when I started putting, well, when I started looking at the talks being proposed for RubyConf this year, there were a lot of future-looking talks, talks looking at the future, talks looking at the way R Ruby can improve. And I kind of thought, well, why don't we look at where Ruby came from? Why don't we look at uh, the inspirations for Ruby? And small talk is a, a very heavy inspiration for it. Um, so as Matt mentioned, my name is Sasha Durand. I'm a programmer working for Big Commerce. Um, I'd like to dedicate my talk to Jim. Um, Ruby cones in particular was uh, a big impact on me when I was first learning Ruby. Um, so I guess a timely question is what is small talk anyway and what relation does it have at a Ruby conference? Well, small talk is very much a forebear of Ruby. Um, it's had a, a very strong influence on it. So similar to Ruby, it's object oriented dynamically typed. It's an interpreted language, it's got reflective properties, um, it's also strongly typed. Um, and it was created in the, the late 60s and early 70s as part of a, a movement which was occurring around uh, human computer symbiosis, so the idea of stopping using punch cards and interact with computers in, in different ways in there. And it was created at the famous Xerox Park Institute by Alan Kay, Dan Ingalls, Adol Goldberg, Ted Kalis, Scott Wallace, and many others in there. Um, so Alan Kay, if you've never heard of him, is considered one of the fathers of object oriented programming. And he also did a lot of the, the really early work on modern windowing, sort of overlaid <coughs> windowing GUI systems. Dan Ingalls actually implemented at least the five first generations of Smalltalk under Alan's uh, initial instruction. And Adele did quite a lot of work on the uh, what they called design templates at the time, which was like a forebear of what we know as design patterns today. Um, so how did Smalltalk get its name? Um, so there's a good quote from Alan about it. So he says that he called it Smalltalk as in programming should be a matter of small talk. Um, and children should program in small talk. So the, the research group that he was part of was working on uh, new ways of introducing people to programming and small talk as a language and a development environment was orientated towards, um, towards that goal in there. So he also said that I figured that small talk was so innocuous a label that it ever, if it ever did anything nice, people would be pleasantly surprised. So when you compare it to a name like Agol or Fortran or COBOL, it's, it's a much more innocuous kind of name in there. So I won't go through the complete slide, but basically from the um, 60s through to the late 70s, a lot of concepts that Alan Kay had been working on and influences that he'd had from other languages like Logo, which was a, a Lisp-based language, um, were kind of uh, uh, implemented really early at, uh, at Xerox Park and then worked on further to the point where they actually in 1980 got a version that they were prepared to provide to external companies for peer review. There's a, um, there's a good anecdote around the point where Steve Jobs came and toured Xerox Park so he quite infamous, infamously came and visited their, their grounds and, and talked to the various groups they had there and walked out with a windowing system, mouse, keyboard and what we know as Mac OS pretty much today. Adele Goldberg kind of infamously refused to demonstrate small talk to him and had to be forced um, by management to do it and uh, the benefit of that was a lot of inspiration for the early work on uh, Mac OS and the lease from Macintosh at the time. Unfortunately, after Smalltalk 80 got released, so in, in the 80s commercialization of software and development environments was a big thing, 
and Smalltalk suffered from that. So in the 90s, languages like Java got released for free, which made it very hard to compete when um, providers like Park Play Systems and Digitalk were charging the order of $5,000 a seat for developers to use Smalltalk. So it's pretty hard to skill people up on a language where the entry level for a company or anyone interested in it is so high. So it was a little bit self-defeating, unfortunately. Luckily, it influenced people like Matt's. Um, open source versions have continued. Squeak, probably most infamously, um, got, were continued on it by Ian and, and other original Smalltalk developers. Faro is a version that's based on Squeak. All, all of these are freely downloadable. And there's a new version as well, which is more um, command line orientated. So one of the limitations of Smalltalk was previously that it's in incredibly GUI orientated. So it was difficult to actually run on the command line, which was one of the shortcomings of it. So just going back to the, uh, the language itself. Uh, so one of the big things about Smalltalk at the time was it was really the first object oriented language and is kind of infamous for that. So again, similar to Ruby, an object is always an instance of a class. Classes uh, behave as blueprints, so they describe the behavior and the properties of class instances. There's a bit of polymorphic behavior in there, so classes can extend a superclass, so you can uh, create subclasses. And all values in Smalltalk are objects, whether it be nil or boolean or rather such things. And extending that further, so Smalltalk is a relatively limited language compared to Ruby, um, but they do share some similarities. Smalltalk objects can do exactly three things. So they can hold state, like references to other objects. Uh, they can receive messages, and they could send messages in the context of actually receiving a message. And again, um, with the exception of comments, I, I don't know how well anyone can read this, um, but the literal syntax in Smalltalk is not dissimilar to Ruby. Um, slightly different for, for symbols. Um, there's no regex in Smalltalk in there. Um, it's actually a lot more flexible in terms of numbers, so you can have uh, binary numbers in there. So the, again, I don't know whether anyone can read it, it looks pretty blurred to me, um, and tiny. But there's a two at the start, which is indicating the base, and then R, and then a binary number after there, and a hex number. So all of those are valid numbers in Smalltalk. And the array syntax is not, not hugely dissimilar to Ruby, just using different characters. Um, probably one of the key differences between the languages is Smalltalk doesn't use commas to separate values. Um, so variable declaration, the main, main difference between Smalltalk and, and Ruby is that in Ruby you can just declare things anywhere. Um, in Smalltalk you have to actually declare usage of variables. So uh, a method of doing that is to use pipes around the, the name of your variable. So there's a, a single variable being declared there, A, um, and below it variables A, B, and C being declared. Um, for people who've written in languages like Go, assignment for variables is a lot, a lot closer to that in, in Ruby. Ruby um, characters for assigning variables are uh, uh, equality comparisons in Smalltalk, and otherwise identity comparison is the same as in Ruby. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll stop going on about it now because it's fairly dry and boring and we're getting near the end of RubyConf. There's certainly lots of, uh, lots of links I've got at the end of the talk where if you're interested about actually programming in Smalltalk, there's information there for you on it. Um, so I'll talk just about some of the differences between Smalltalk and Ruby, just, just briefly. Um, so Smalltalk itself is more than just a language. Um, so when you're developing in Smalltalk, you're developing inside the, the virtual machine. And state is a big part 
of developing in small talk. So it's like having a, a functional core dump available to you at any one time. Um, it's always being persisted. It's always available for inspection in there. So everything is getting stored inside that image. So the benefit of that is when you're writing code, you can quite easily change things on the fly. So if you think of how easy it is to monkey patch classes and objects in Ruby, imagine if you can do that at runtime while you're actually developing a new programs in flight. You can actually change the, the method signature or the return value on things. The other benefit of that is that it's quite easy to actually debug issues. You know, you can actually get hold of all the information about your, your program state and, and see what was actually happening in that stack at the time rather than having to reproduce it after the fact. So the core difference is that Smalltalk is really the language as well as the virtual machine. So it's not about editing code files and running it through an interpreter. It's about starting the virtual machine and you're actually editing text. You're, you're editing your classes in, inside that file. And there's, there's really amazing tools in there. So Smalltalk was actually the very first um, development environment I ever saw as a kid. My dad was working for Telecom's research labs at the time, and I think I might have been God, um, seven years old, I think, maybe even, even younger. He had me, I was sick off work, took me in to work, dumped me in front of an engineer who was playing around with small talk, and I, I saw this development environment and was just kind of blown away by it. Um, and I definitely have not seen anything kind of since that's been on a par with it. So within the, the virtual machine, you've, of course, you've got a, a code editor, but you've got a, a class class browser, which also allows you to actually inspect messages in flight. It allows you to inspect every aspect of your program as it's actually running. You've got a standard graphic library there for you, full of widgets, and is able to be redefined there for your use. There's debuggers, there's profilers, there's test runners, all sitting there waiting for you to use. Um, and, and there's a lot more. Uh, I could go on for some time. So. I'll just touch on some of the semantic differences between them. Um, so Ruby, as we know, has mix-ins. Smalltalk doesn't. It's a really, really simple implement implementation. It, it's kind of like Ruby 15 years before it. Um, Ruby allows you to do to add methods to, to objects. Um, you can't do that in Smalltalk. They all reside inside inside classes. You can certainly redefine those things uh, within the virtual machine, um, but you can't actually add things. In Ruby, of course, um, with method missing and other built-ins, it's really easy to redefine things on the fly dynamically. Um, the general approach in Smalltalk is to treat them completely statically. Um, another Key differentiation is Ruby with class definitions gives you really good macros, and Smalltalk doesn't have any. Um, it's really, really quite bare bones in that regard. Uh, what, one of the other, um, the other things in Smalltalk which is actually really beneficial is implementations like audit collection. So uh, you can assign Say you had a, a list of values that you wanted to remain sorted while you mutated it through different things. So you say you had a, a list of products and uh, through a um, through some kind of process you, you were mutating, you were changing things and you wanted them to remain sorted all the way through that process. In Smalltalk you can do it. You can just assign it to an ordered collection and within the implementation itself, it, it will remain sorted. In, in Ruby, obviously, you've got to call sort on your array every time. So one of, one of the things I, I got from my exploration through Smalltalk was there's a lot of things we can, we can actually learn from, um, from Smalltalk, and in particular, the development kind of environment. 
The class browser itself is fantastic for developing. Um, it gives you a really good view of your application in flight in a way you generally don't get with Ruby programs. You may get uh, a small view into it using a REPL like IRB or um, may maybe exercising your test suite in a certain way to produce certain behavior, but the stuff that's built in to Smalltalk's VM is just really invaluable. The debugging side of it in particular um, is, is just really amazing. Um, I think if I had grown up writing code in Smalltalk, I think I, I would have moaned the rest of my life about the lack of this. It's really just eye-opening. And I highly recommend, if you have time, um, there's links I've got at the end of the talk which allow you to download it and run, run Squeak or one of the other more modern implementations of Smalltalk on your system, just run it, if only to have a look at the kind of debugging and profiling information that's built into it. So the biggest kind of insight I had is that Smalltalk's VM is basically light table. So it, I, I don't know whether anyone watched Brett Victor's um, Future of Programming talk a little while ago, which eventually kind of morphed into the Kickstarter project um, called Light Table. That's basically Smalltalk's VM in many ways. You can change things on the fly. Virtually the entire implementation of Smalltalk within the VM can be altered at runtime. Um, I think that's it's certainly something as a, a Rubyist that I would get a, a huge amount of benefit from. And given that Light Table's been focused on other languages apart from Ruby, it would be great to see something like that implemented. So it, that's it. It's a very short talk. Thanks for your time. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. I've been kind of... I don't know whether anyone will have any questions. I was just kind of rambling in terms of my observations about small talk, but if you have. What specifically do you like about the class browser? Could you explain what that feature is and um, what the other one you mentioned? Uh, the debugger and, and profiler. Yeah, like what specifically do you like about those features? Um, well, one good way could be just to bring it up, actually. If Squeak decides to behave. The real benefit I found is just being able to do inspection on any part of your code, so whether, whether it be the, uh, the objects themselves or um, messages that are in flight. Damn you, Squeak. So I don't know whether everyone can see that. So this is the, uh, the browser inside Smalltalk. So it's listing a whole series of methods in there. So you can start traversing down the tree to different things that are defined in there. So I touched on senders. So you can, you can flag uh, selectors for different messages that may be getting sent through your system. Um, so you can f uh, you can inspect them at runtime. Uh, it's kind of like regex. In there. Yeah. I don't know whether that answered your question, but that's I, what I'm it is. Sure. Yes. 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 Anything is changeable at runtime for good or evil. Can you just go through a bit more of the squeak image you've got there? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's incredibly bare bones. There is nothing really in there. Um, but I'm happy to just show different parts of it. So this is the, uh, the browser. 
and there's a, a series of other tools available here. So you've, you've got a, a test runner, you've got a process browser, you can find methods easily within it. So in, in many ways, Smalltalk's VM is like, the, it was the, the first IDE as we know it today. Um, you've got additional things in there. So all of the, uh, the profiling and uh, more low level commands uh, under extras, you can load additional ones in there, but you, you can manually um, kick off garbage collection, you can run a profiler, uh, you can get statistics about the virtual machine. That's, that is written in Smalltalk as well. Hi, can you um, programmatically alter methods at runtime? And if so, is there any mm, sensible use case for that? I don't, I, I don't believe you can in Smalltalk, no. Um, you can alter the virtual machine. That, that was one of the limitations of it, that you needed to be running the uh, GUI for it, essentially. Yeah, but it, I, I know in GNU, um, Smalltalk you can. So that's a more scripting friendly version of Smalltalk. Um, just with the class browser, can you see the, how it's running at runtime? Like that's quite a static view of the classes that are defined. Could you sort of say have a web server and see how the classes are being used when it's actually running and accepting connections yeah, and yeah, stuff? So you can. So there's a, a web framework for Smalltalk called Seaside um, at seaside.org. And they've got um, quite a good tutorial for doing that kind of process level inspection on a, a running application serving web requests. Cool. Uh, one more over here. Yeah, last one over here. It might be a bit basic, but you were mentioning images. Yes. And I just thought maybe you could elaborate a bit. Like, are they always there, always saved, or only on crashes, or what? Sure. Um, so the image for the Smalltalk VM um, mm -hmm. persists at a, a regular interval mm -hmm. in it. Um, so if your application does crash, you do have it available to you. Okay. So it's just it's it's within a couple seconds of when it last happened. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's thank Sasha. Thank you.